The older I get, the less black and white the world becomes, right? (laughs) I think that for most of us, that is a normal trajectory. We begin to understand that our own experiences, our own perspective, our own struggles and strengths are not the same as everyone else's. And I think on an intellectual level, we all know that there are things out there that affect other people in a way that don't affect us, or that even if we share some sort of uh, experience or situation that someone else has or shares with us, our experience of that will be different. And so today's conversation is one that I have been really looking forward to because it falls under that umbrella of when you know better, you can do better. It may not be a scenario where you're doing anything wrong necessarily, but it may be something where my guest, Rose McAvoy, sheds a light on something that you may just not be paying attention to in your business that can actually make a really big difference, not only for you and the people that you're able to work with and welcome into your business, but also for those people. Because Rose is here today to talk about a kind of quietly underserved segment of the market, which is the 15% of the human population that is estimated to be in the category of neurodiverse. So Rose is going to explain a little bit more about neurodiversity, neurodivergence, but she's also going to talk a little bit about the small tweaks, the small things that we as business owners and specifically as photographers can do to help make the neurodiverse community and the community of people whose family members are affected by neurodiversity feel welcome and safe when they go to hire us. I specifically wanted to have this conversation and share this conversation with you at a time of year when I know a lot of us are very busy and sort of doing the work of finishing up our, you know, photography work for the year, shopping. You might be listening to this while you are on a, uh, you know, running errands, something like that. The nice thing about this topic is that it's not a you have to run and take action right now kind of a topic. It's something that I want you to put in the back of your head over the next couple of months and let it marinate. And that's not to say like walk away from it and don't take action. I do want you to take action. But these are the kinds of things that I think that as you are doing those annual tweaks in your business at the beginning of the year, these are the kinds of things that you can start to incorporate. You can take one or two or 10 of the ideas that Rose is going to share and build them into your business in such a way that you benefit yourself and your clientele. You guys are gonna love this conversation. Welcome to This Can't Be That Hard. My name is Anami Tonkin, and I help photographers run profitable, sustainable businesses that they love. Each week on the podcast, I cover simple, actionable strategies and systems that photographers at every level of experience can use to earn more money in a more sustainable way. Running a photography business doesn't have to be that hard. You can do it, and I can show you how. Rose McAvoy, welcome to This Can't Be That Hard. This is a long overdue conversation. I'm very excited to have you on the show. How are you today? I am doing really well. I am enjoying the last couple of weeks of summer vacation with my kids before we restart the yelling and hollering to get up so you don't miss the school bus routine, (laughs) which I don't love. (laughs) Yeah, yep, it definitely like we're we're heading into that season and it always surprises me even though it happens every year. You know, we have been talking about having you um on the show for a while and you have lots of different things that I feel like you could bring you can bring to the table. But when you came to me with this idea about having this conversation about neurodivergence, neurodiversity, being more inclusive in your business, I just was like, yes, 100% perfect. I am very excited to have this conversation, which I feel like is an under, it's just a conversation that doesn't happen that much in this industry. So before we get all the way down into that, let's, um, let's back up, let me back up and have you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are, but also how you became as familiar as you are with this topic. Yeah. So Uh, I am a family photographer, and I like to say that I take pictures of kids and their grownups in a playful way because I really do direct a lot of 
my language to working with kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm in the greater Seattle area. I grew up in Seattle. I'm a Pacific Northwesterner to the core. If it's not a little bit cloudy or damp, at least once a week, I get antsy. (laughs) But I, I always say that my journey is a little of a how I met your mother story. It's like everything led to the next thing. But I am a proudly neurodivergent human myself. And I, uh, I always sort of felt a little bit funky in social situations. It's hard to be an extrovert who also feels like weird about social things. So mm-hmm. you're constantly like doing that thing where you leave and you go, oh my gosh, I don't know if they like said anything. I talked the whole time. Like yeah. that whole pleasure to have in class, but talks too much. Yeah, that's me. But during COVID, I realized that my oldest, who I always felt like, oh, his energy is kind of like a little different, but it's not getting in his way. It was getting in his way. Mm -hmm. And so we pursued, I like to use the word identification Mm -hmm. of ADHD. And that's when we also learned that he is autistic. Mm -hmm. And at the time I thought, well, that's odd because he's really empathetic. He loves sarcasm. He totally is like super conversational and he makes eye contact. And I quickly understood that a lot of these things are stereotypes and cliches. I don't want to say myth necessarily because they do apply in some situations, but that the definition of what being an autistic person looks like is so much broader and more nuanced than our popular culture would have us believe. And as I started to understand that and work more with the person who diagnosed him, and we kind of looked at my other son, and then she said, you know, (laughs) there's a really strong genetic link with neurodivergence in families. So we could put you through the official process too. And uh, she had already diagnosed me. We just had to do all the paperwork, sure, essentially. Sure. So yeah, it's been a couple of years. And for us, it's been super positive. It's opened the door to understanding, to making connections. I'm an Enneagram one. I like things to be real clear cut. Yep. And for a while, I wondered, like, is this because of my neurodivergence? And I've talked to other people, and they're all uh, different Enneagrams with their neurodivergence. And that kind of is the point Um, And why I wanted to have this conversation is because there are so many cliches and misunderstandings about what neurodivergence is. And just really quick, neurodiverse is all different brain wirings. Neurodivergence is when you're talking about someone's brain wiring that differs from what society currently considers typical. Correct. And right. that encompasses so many things. We're talking about ADHD, which is a terrible term. And a lot of people in the community would like to change that term mm-hmm. um, because attention deficit hyperactivity disorder really is very misleading. There's a um, lot of there's but, a lot of negativity in that statement. As yes. Well. yes. And it the term really comes, uh, this is where it also gets really intersectional. So if we're talking about being inclusive, and this is where you're seeing my ADHD, I am all over the That's place. That's okay. I'm but following you. There's a point. Um, yes. So when we're talking about these uh, different neurodiversities, we are also talking about a lot of intersectionality. Mm-hmm. There is a huge overlap, especially with the trans community. Um, many in the trans community are also autistic or have other neurodivergences. Many people who have one neurodivergence have multiple co-occurring neurodivergences. It's linked negatively and diagnostically to mental health disorders, but a neurodivergence isn't in and of itself a mental health disorder. And I feel like the more we even have this conversation, the more people might be getting knots in their stomach about like, but you'd have to be a really evolved person not to, because there's just so much that comes with it. And I myself am not that evolved when I start to think about it. And opening your doors of as a service provider to this community can feel really daunting. And I want to pause there to talk a little bit about how what everything that you're saying right now is 
important to why we're having this conversation. So, and I know that we're going to get there, but I just want to say like from my own interviewer perspective and from my own photographer, photography business owning perspective, we're talking about estimated 15% of the population. And that is where we're talking. I mean, that, that doesn't even include the percent of the population that like isn't getting identified or anything else. So this is a huge number of people. And when we inside our heads as photographers are, you know, waiting for our calendars to fill up and whatever, and we're looking around and we're like, our prices are too high. My price is too high. That's why no one's hiring me. You know, there are a billion different reasons why that might be the case. And not one, but many of them, 15, let's say 15% of the population of people who have come across your photos and said, wow, those are really beautiful. I have a family. I would love to have something like that. Or I have a business and I need photos for my business, whatever the case may be. It may be in around 15% of the time that person is being stopped by something else that has nothing to do yeah. with you necessarily, but it yeah. may be a bridge that you can help them cross. And so right. that's kind of where I want to dig into. Uh, and I know that that's where we're going anyway. So I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. And so by kind of giving a tip of the iceberg of what some of these challenges might be as far as what's going on behind the scenes. In my business, I like to talk to parents about their kids and how their kids are going to be welcomed and a accepted. It's easier, I think, for parents to think about the neurodivergence of their kids. Adults haven't been identified and diagnosed as often. So if you tell your your clients that their kids are going to be welcome and taken care of, their kids can wear what they're comfortable wearing, that you're willing to be flexible. And this is tricky for some And it goes against a little bit of the marketing training that we've been taught, which is to be real specific about what you do and why you do it. And that's great because that also helps people with neurodivergence. They want to know what to expect. Mm -hmm. The obstacle of not knowing what to expect can be really tricky. I would say using lots of different forms of communication to talk about your messaging, giving people lots of examples in different ways, having a a chunk of text here, but then the same information in a bullet list over here. Having video of behind the scenes of a session. And this is not necessarily things that I have put into place myself comprehensively, but mm-hmm. these are things that can just be really helpful. Sure. Giving people audio and um, text, giving people bullets and photos, giving people different ways to do that. But also reassuring people that you're going to be there to remind them. Short-term memory and time blindness are some big challenges for people who are neurodivergent or can be. Mm -hmm. And so reiterating what to expect in lots of different ways patiently and not, not in a way that's like, okay, so you have a preschooler's brain, so we need to like spell this out. But just like, hey, don't forget, um, I have a copywriter and when her email comes, it says, I'm sure you haven't forgotten. But just so that it's top of the pile, here are the details. Mm -hmm. And things like that are just really, really helpful. Clutter is overwhelming for a lot of people with neurodivergence. And so they might get rid of their notifications and think, oh, I'll come back to that and then forget to come back to it Mm -hmm. because the notification is gone. So being patient about reminding people, letting them know in your copy that you will remind them. Don't worry, I will remind you. Your phone call Teaching is incredibly helpful for people with neurodivergence. A lot of people like myself process by speaking. And so having that call is helpful. And then they don't have to write an essay to explain what they want. They just get to tell you and then it's done. Yeah. I have yet to hear anything that you are saying that isn't good practice for anyone. Becoming overstimulated, I think, is not something that's limited to any particular portion of the population. And so uh, even when you were just talking about like laying things out in both, you know, a paragraph and then bullet points and then intersperse that with pictures. I mean, that's web design 101. People don't have the capacity to just sit down and read the novel of how it is to work with you. And so if that's what you require, that's you're going to lose people. I think that that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation. I want people to see that if you start thinking through this lens of this type of accessibility, you are probably already doing a lot of it and Mm -hmm. not realizing it. Mm -hmm. And by adding the layer of understanding Mm -hmm. 
that this is also helping a demographic that is not feeling fully served, you can maybe even take it to the next level. I think language is really important when you're doing any work on inclusivity. And so if this is an area that you want to broaden your reach a little bit more, that getting into some spaces where you can listen to neurodivergent adults talk about their experience would be really helpful. When we first started moving into this space as a family, I got into some Facebook groups that are led by autistic voices and listening there to the questions that people were asking and the way that they were talking about their experience has been really helpful. I think this all absolutely applies to everybody, but there's kind of a heightened next step that if you as a service provider and as a photographer have an awareness of, it can help to navigate if and when things come up. Yeah. Um, But the bottom line is make sure that your clients know that you want to get to know them. And because it looks different for every neurodivergent person, the most important thing is to ask questions and to ask questions in a way that makes people feel safe to answer those questions. You can ask, and I do this on my questionnaire, are there any mobility or sensory concerns for anybody in your group that might impact their comfort? And that's where you're going to start to get a lot of interesting information. I've always asked this question, even before our family had any particular understanding. You know, I think we hack our own brains as we go through life anyway. So. The words accommodation and accessibility can feel really overwhelming. You think, well, I'm a photographer. I can't build a wheelchair ramp because Mm -hmm. I meet people all over the place. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is asking people, what helps your family to feel most itself? What helps your family to feel most comfortable? Things that we're already doing. But then listening with a slightly different ear to, to catch where they might be telling you some of these other things, like that this is a, maybe a bigger picture. And they're waiting to hear from you how you respond mm-hmm. before they're going to give you any other information. It's the old uh, Ted Lasso truism of be curious, not judgmental. The thing that I feel really strongly about is that as photographers, the majority of us, I think, come to the table with an, like a heaping dose of empathy. And I think that in the quiet of your headphones listening to a podcast about this, I have no doubt that essentially everyone listening is like, oh, this is great yeah. information for me to have. And what I love about the way that you're sort of explaining this and presenting it is that it really is, you know, it does feel whenever there is an area that we don't know a lot about, perhaps, or don't feel like we have expertise in, it can be easy to shy away and say, well, because I don't know anything about that, I just don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Because the last thing that I would want to do is offend someone or say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. But I think that what you are illustrating here is that by just kind of tuning into this frequency, like knowing that that's there, knowing that that is an issue for a large percentage of the population, and that by making some small changes to language and the way that you, you know, the questions that you ask and the the sort of openness that you come to a new relationship with, you are opening the door for people who are potentially underserved. Yeah. And I think One of the things, and I was kind of saying this already, because historically people who were quirky or odd or differently wired or squirrel brained, as we're now kind of talking, (laughs) neurospicy, it's the conversation is starting to open up a lot more. Mm -hmm. But we are far from shaking ourselves free from a lot of these myths and misunderstandings. And people want to be seen. They just want to be seen. And that's why I think as photographers, we are so beautifully positioned to serve the neurodivergent community. When I started doing this, I wanted to make it really clear that, and by doing this, I mean, just like intentionally seeking to incorporate language that was going to 
show that I was open to working with all neurodiversities. Mm -hmm. It was, I'm not doing this as a charity. However, if you are a kid who is constantly being the center of a meeting where your behavior is being challenged or you have challenging behavior. Uh, Dr. Ross Green, who wrote The Explosive Child, calls it unlucky behaviors. Mm -hmm. Kids with unlucky behaviors get talked about a lot Mm -hmm. and it's not in a celebratory way. But if your family takes the time to say you are important, you matter, your strengths are beautiful and we appreciate them and need them so much that we're going to make time as a family to take these pictures. And we're going to not only take these pictures, but we're going to print them out. We're going to put them on the wall. We're going to make them into an album. I think for kids who are neurodivergent to have an album of family pictures, this is something that we all know as photographers is important and valuable, right? Yeah. But you're that kid, that kid, right? In quotes. And you get to go home and snuggle up with pictures of, and just, I mean, you're flipping through. These people love me. These people care about me. We talk about photography as being positive for mental health. That's exponentially positive for mental health when you're talking about kids who are constantly struggling because they have unlucky behaviors. So making sure that you are communicating to families that this is something where you are a safe person, you understand, you want to know how to serve them, it can be huge for a family. Absolutely. And they will, you will be their photographer for life. Yeah. And I see that with my clients. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, let's take this down to the, you've, you've got me sold on this idea. (laughs) Uh, And we have talked a little bit about the, the how, but let's talk a little bit about how you can kind of make that known in your, you know, your website copy or your, um, your yeah. social media messaging, how you can make the booking or the onboarding process work a little better, like fill me with all of your strategies. Okay. So again, some of these things I'm also telling myself while we're having this conversation. That's okay. <laughs> because you know, businesses grow slowly. So yes. these building blocks are, some of them are still coming, but things like, you know, you teach, having a video when somebody connects with you. So sending them a video can be really helpful because then they get your information in their ears as Mm -hmm. well as in front of their eyes. Mm -hmm. And then following that up with written information is incredibly helpful. Having a phone call and if possible, having a video call with your clients can be really helpful because again, if you can just find ways to connect with people in multi-sensory ways, you're going to be serving them better. Mm -hmm. And that's people in general, but particularly people who might be processing information in ways that you aren't used to or haven't quite understood even exist, you know, And, and we don't know what we don't know. But again, that's why you kind of ask, ask people, what is your preferred way to communicate? Yeah. And maybe, you get a Voxer account and you mm-hmm. just leave voicemails with your client. Yep. Maybe you always just send them a video. Being willing to move quickly or stay in close contact with people if they're scheduling further out, I think can be really helpful. Um, one thing that comes with the ADHD brain is this is really exciting. I want to do this right now. I only want to do this right now. And if it doesn't happen right now, then I like it's going to be really hard for me. Right. But if you're booking two months out, then keeping in contact with your clients with just little pings along the way can be really helpful because once that thing becomes uninteresting, it's like an immovable object to get up and excited about it. And that can be tricky too. Sure. So keeping it fresh for your clients can be really helpful. When you are asking for information, um, one thing that can be really helpful is putting anything that you can into like Dropbox or check boxes, things like that. Dopamine is something that people like myself with ADHD and other neurodivergences are always seeking. You hear it like, oh, this is dopamine seeking. And you get those fidgets and poppets and like people are doing all these different things. But it is true. It's a chemical in your brain that our our brains don't like sponge it up quite the same way. Mm -hmm. So having little fun things can be really helpful. It also takes 
if I send my client a questionnaire that's just short answer, long answer, short answer, long answer, I may never hear from them. Mm -hmm. Like, really, I might not. You might ask them, hey, I have this questionnaire. It's got some spaces for you to answer in long form, short form. Would you like to get on the phone? And I can just ask you the questions and type in your answers. Different things like that are 100% accommodations and 100% easy for most of us to implement. Sure. You know, like I was saying, it's not about us building a wheelchair ramp so that they can get to us at the park. It's about finding just these little ways that help our clients to be successful because that's yeah. what we want. We yep. want our clients to be successful. And to feel great about how, yeah. you know, how we made them feel. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's you're affirming that it's okay mm-hmm. to do things in a slightly different way. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, all kinds of different ideas are coming to my head about like, yeah, I could get on the phone and kind of interview you about the questionnaire or you can read through the questionnaire and record me a voice memo yep. with your answers to it. Like whatever's quickest, whatever's easiest for you. And again, I mean, that's great as far as an accommodation. It also accommodates a lot of people who are busy and on the go yep. and who are out of practice writing long paragraphs about themselves. So <laughs> I think that's a yeah. great tip. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, a lot of us think about things like while we're in the car or yeah. something like that, right? You go, oh, I'm supposed to do this, this, and this, or in the shower, right? Yep. It's it's these times where our bodies stop moving, so our brains kind of take over. Yep. And if you give your clients different options about how they can communicate with you and how you will communicate with them, it can smooth a lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. And it normalizes that there are lots of different ways to do to reach the same goal. Yeah. The what is important, the why is important, the how can look lots of different ways. Sure. So good. And that's totally fine. When you're thinking about language, like on social media and your web copy, taking a few words out of your vocabulary could be helpful. We all, you know, like you get expressive and you might say, oh, crazy, right? If you just take that word out and start to be intentional about using something like wacky, bonkers, bananas, that can go a long way towards making you look like a more safe person to work with. Yeah. Right. If some of these trigger words don't come up in your copy, that's a really easy way to just be a safer person. And I think, you know, you were already saying this, we're preaching to the choir in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. People are doing a lot of these things already, Mm -hmm. but it's just taking it to that next level of mindfulness and intentionality that can open the door that much wider and serve your people that much more effectively and positively. One thing you can do in your prep with your clients is remind parents in the week before their session to really praise their family, Mm. praise other, praise your kids. Because again, we're talking about people who often are called out for all of their deficiencies. Mm -hmm. So if you really lean into all of the ways that they are doing a great job, that they are successful and in a true way, hey, I saw that you did that. That was really great. Or I really liked when you blah, blah, blah. You know, remind your clients that that work in the week ahead of their session and you know, two, three weeks ahead of the, like whatever. But in the week ahead of your session, if you're being really intentional about praising your family, Mm -hmm. it's going to show in how everybody goes through their session. You know, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty about, okay, you have an autistic kid who's coming and like, these are the steps to work with them. Because again, you need to talk to your clients, have a conversation and say, hey, what are some things that you see coming up over and over again that could potentially be a trigger. Or if so-and-so gets overwhelmed, becomes dysregulated during the session, how do you see that going? Like, what do you want to do? So that if that happens, you can just say, okay, we knew that this was a possibility and it's totally fine. Yeah, Um, Building in extra time, letting families know your one hour session is not 60 minutes on the dot. I do not set a time. I want to kind of mention in here, like I'm just nodding along to everything that you're saying. And I think that um, that I hope everyone who's listening really hears this and takes it to heart. It is hard. And I will acknowledge to on the one hand, know like I need to have policies. I need to put parameters around the work that I do. I need to have 
a process that I explain to people and like, we're going to do this and then it's going to go like this. And then, you know, you need to contact me this way. I mean, I preach and teach these things all the time. However, I think that most of us need some sort of framework and we need those like, okay, this is how I do it. And most of our clients are going to gravitate towards someone who says, I, okay, I'm going to use a, I'm going to, I'm going to make up a metaphor on the spot. It's probably going to be mediocre at best. Um, but I worked in the <laughs> restaurant industry when I was a teenager and young, you know, 20 something. And we had a menu, right? It was like, here's what we serve. The, here are the appetizers. Here are the entrees. Here are the desserts. And there were people who came in who had preferences and allergies and whatever. And we didn't just say, here's a list of everything we have in the kitchen. Let us know what you would like. We said, here's our menu. And the people who came in with allergies or preferences that ran counter to what was on the menu would say, actually, I'm allergic to gluten, so can we make this but substitute this and this? And there are chefs out there who are like, no substitutions, get out of my restaurant. And there are, you know, restaurants that are welcoming. And the question is like, you know, if you want to have a business that is both successful but also welcoming, you need to make sure that you make it clear that like this is the process. Yeah. However, I understand that all of my clients are, you know, have unique needs and challenges. If there is something that seems stressful to you, I'm more than happy to talk about it. And maybe illustrating that with some stories that don't necessarily say like this kid was a nightmare, yeah. but say, you know, oh, it was challenging. It was a hard day for this kid. And so this is how we accommodated that. You know, I think about when my kids first started getting haircuts and I took my oldest to the $12 place down the street, right? Sure. The the high volume national chain. Yeah. And the guy there, they tend to be just in general people who are not as experienced. Mm -hmm. And this is painting with a broad brush, but they're newer in the field anyway. So this guy was younger, probably in his 20s. And he looked at my kid who was maybe three. And I could tell he was already nervous. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he was real tense during that haircut. And I tried my best to put both people at ease. And my kid wasn't that nervous about it. And I sort of held up a little cartoon on my phone and was like, you know, you just can watch this and whatever, like you do your thing. But he nicked his ear because he was super, oh. super stressed. <laughs> and it just like, I could tell that the person giving the haircut was just so incredible incredibly uncomfortable sure. working with a kid. Yeah. And again, you know, my kids now we have an understanding of their neurodivergence, but at the time there were really no visible challenges. So yeah. that's not part of this situation. It really yeah. was just, here was a little kid and maybe he's going to do this and I don't know and what happens. And, and after that, I started driving over 30 minutes each way to go to a place that specialized in giving kids haircuts. Right. And my point here is that if opening your doors wider or providing some flexibility to your clients in this way is just really not going to work for you, you don't have to do it, mm -hmm. you know, and to yeah. your point, you don't have to do it. I'm not saying sitting here saying, okay, everybody, this is how we're going to like all move together. Mm -hmm. But if this conversation can help people to say, oh, I'm already doing a lot of things really well. Maybe I can be intentional with a couple other tweaks and that that would help broaden my openness to and the way that people see the work that I'm doing, that they are welcome here too. Oh, I love that. Yeah. This you've given me actually a couple of very specific pointers that I'm going to go back and uh, and come <laughs> through my stuff for. Um, but yeah. this this has been as I knew it would be a great conversation. So, Rose, let everybody know um, where they can find you and uh, and get in touch with you. Yeah, if this is a conversation you want to keep having, I would love to talk to people. Um, you can reach me on Instagram at Rose McAvoy Photography. You can check out my website, rosemacavoyphotography.com. And I push a lot of socials to Facebook yeah. um, at Rose McAvoy Photography. But yeah, you can find me in all the places. All the places. Rose, again, thank you so much. I look forward to continuing this conversation, but thank you for being a voice about an important topic. And uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me and for uh, bringing this conversation to a broader photography audience. My pleasure. It's what I'm here for. 
Well, that's it for this week's episode of This Can't Be That Hard. I'll be back same time, same place next week. In the meantime, you can find more information about this episode, along with all the relevant links, notes, and downloads at thiscan'tbethathard.com slash learn. If you like the podcast, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Even better, share the love by leaving a review in iTunes. And as always, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you have a fantastic week.